Hello friends, today we will talk about the legendary four-story house which turned into an impregnable fortress during the Battle of Stalingrad, where a group of Soviet soldiers held the defense for 58 days. This house is known all over the world as the Pavlov House by the name of the senior sergeant. However, not everything is so obvious in this story. And today I will tell you whose house it really was. And I will also share the memories of the lieutenant of Anasev who led his defense. Stalingrad, autumn. This autumn month proved to be the most difficult for General Rodintsev division. They had to face two divisions of the enemy. In some places the fascist troops almost reached the bank of the Volga. The front line was reduced to the distance of a grenade throw. For the German army this situation was unexpected and unusual. It was impossible to use either aviation or even medium artillery, not to mention heavy. The fighting in the city was extremely fierce and intense and continued almost around the streets and squares of Stalingrad. Even the generals of the Wehrmacht were amazed by the steadfastness and tenacity of the Soviet troops. A participant in the Battle of Stalingrad, German general Hans Der later wrote, For every house, workshop, water tower, embankment, wall, basement, and finally for every pile of garbage, a fierce struggle was waged, which was unparalleled even during the First World War, with its gigantic expenditure of ammunition. Despite the massive actions of aviation and artillery, it was impossible to get out of the melee area. The Russians were superior to the Germans in terms of terrain and camouflage and were more experienced in barricade battles for individual houses. They had taken up a solid defense. During the street battles in the autumn of 1942, there were several houses on the square of 9 January that were perfectly suited for defense. It was the commander of the 42nd Guard Rifle Regiment, the 13th Guards Division of the regiment, who gave the command to occupy both houses and create strong points there. However, one of these buildings was soon completely destroyed by the Germans. The soldiers defending it, led by Lieutenant Zabolotny, died a brave death under the rubble. The group of Sergeant Pavlov and his three Red Army soldiers were more fortunate. All through they risked, as they turned out not only their lives, but also the lives of civilians who took refuge in the basements of the house. On the night of the 26th September, the commander of the 7th Company, Senior Lieutenant Naumov, instructed the fighters of his group to scout the situation in the four-story buildings on the square of 9 January. From an observation post, the actions of a small group were monitored by battalion commander Alexei Zhukov, who had previously received an order from the regiment commander to seize this house. Half an hour later, the fighters entered the house, but the enemy was not there. After learning about this, reinforcements were sent to the fighters. Pavlov and three soldiers held the building for a day while the battalion commander and the company commander from the drained battalion personnel were recruiting fighters for a new stronghold. A few days later, Pavlov received reinforcements from 17 fighters led by senior lieutenant Afanasyev, who took command of his group. The soldiers brought with them a machine gun and anti-tank rifles. Sometime later, two company mortars appeared in Pavlov's house. The fascist made dozens of attempts to knock the heroes out of the house, but in vain. On the side of General Ordintsev, it was the only building that had never passed into the hands of the Germans since the beginning of its defense, and next to it, with varying success, there were endless battles for the L-shaped house, the 6th school, the NKVD building complex, the dairy house, and the Zabolotny house. There were no features in the design of the house that predestined its special durability. Pavlov's house was still practically a new building by the beginning of the Battle of Stalingrad. It was built in the mid-30s from ordinary brick and wood. There were apartments for party leaders and important industrial specialists. The strength of the Pavlov house lay in its deep connection with other positions of the Soviet troops, as well as its subsequent incorporation into the general scheme of defense. Thanks to the skillful command of Lieutenant Ivan Afanasyev, who proved himself to be a very good commander, an ordinary residential building has turned into an impregnable fortress. Here is a part from the memoir of Lieutenant Afanasyev about the first day of the defense of the house, from the book The House of Soldiers' Glory. 
The first day of defense was relatively calm for us, except for the constant anxiety when you expect a fatal blow from minute to minute. But you don't know where it will come from. How was this day with the neighbors? Did the units of our regiment and battalion manage to hold their previous positions? These questions worried everyone, because fierce battles were going on all day to the right and left of us. By the evening, some suspicious silence was established on our side. The enemy only occasionally fired from machine guns and submachine guns. When it got dark, I sent Ivashenko and Swirin with the first combat report to the company's command post. They reported the scheme of the defense of the house with the exact location of the firing points as well as information about the enemy. In the postscript, he asked to send, if possible, cartridges and hand grenades. The constant and continuous attacks of the Germans who tried to storm Pavlov's house didn't stop. After one of these attacks, the defenders of the house, led by Lieutenant Afanasyev, began underground work. This is how Lieutenant Ivan Afanasyev recalls it in his book The House of Soldiers' Glory. Another day of intense battle has passed. The last enemy attack from Republican Street once again convinced us of the need to take urgent measures to strengthen in this area. That night I sent another combat report to the commander of the rifle company Naumov, and we started the underground walk. To remove the earth from the tunnel, a cartridge box with two ends of ropes was used. A box was pulled out at one end to free it from the soil, and an empty one was dragged behind the other. I had to dig an underground passage lying down. These inconveniences were complemented by the hardness of the soil. Therefore, the miners who walked underground often changed. By 2 o'clock in the morning, we had dug more than half of the underground passage. Tired and half-starved fighters fell asleep. Only those who were on duty in the embrasures were awake. They listened attentively to every sound in the neighboring ruins and in the square. Fascists continuously shelled the house with machine guns and submachine guns. Under the cover of this noise, they decided on a night assault. One of our comrades discovered the approaching Germans, and the garrison met the enemy with rifle fire. The rest of the night and day we were again devoted to underground work. Now all the fighters understood how much we need a new firing point and walk regardless of fatigue. In those days, none of us thought about rest. During the day, we held back the enemy attacks, and at night, we were engaged in improving our positions. During the defense of Pavlov's house, the defenders increased the number of firing points hidden from the enemy by 3-4 times, and the width of defensive line around the house increased by 50-80 meters. Now, fighters were shooting not only from windows and basements, but also from numerous secret hiding places on the approaches to the building. The building was surrounded by barbed wire, the approaches to it were mined. They dug a tunnel for the delivery of ammunition. Window openings were bricked up, embrasures were punched in the walls. A telephone line was established and several hiding firing points were taken outside the building. They could walk in mode of so-called secrets. Defenders of the house could join the fighting only when the enemy forces would pass by and leave them in the rear. The Germans, desperate to take Pavlov's house by storm, came up with a cunning plan. This is how Lieutenant Afanasyev recalls it in the book The House of Soldiers' Glory. More and more often, Soviet units launched counter-attacks. Then from one side, then from the other, came the ura of the defenders of Stalingrad. And the Nazis now shouted in different way. One day Chernyshenko, who was standing at the western wall, heard from the side of the military trade building. Hey Rus, how many people divide one bread? For two people one bread, lieutenant shouted back. Hey Rus, we have one for four soldaten, the same voice replied. I'm changing the machine gun, and you give me a loaf of bread. We have weapons as good as yours, if you want bread, surrender. You Rus will shoot us. But despite the decline in morale in the Hitlerite troops, they still fiercely snapped. They were especially saddened by the loss of the railway walkers' house. They dreamed of taking revenge for it and choose our house as the object. 
Chernyshenko reported to me that in the southwestern direction, not far from the corner of the house, some blows were heard underground. Voronov, Pavlov, Ramazanov and I stood in silence for a long time listening. The noise underground was like a shovel hitting hard ground. They were digging under us, Ramazanov said in a whisper. We immediately reported the enemy's idea to the company commander Naumov. Fifteen minutes later, a major of the engineering troops came to us with the sound devices and headphones. He sat in silence for a while, then took off his headphones and shouted, Here in this place, punch the foundation and dig a trench as deep as possible, two meters from the corner of the building. Without wasting a minute, we got down to business. The enemy heard our blows. The Nazis guessed that their idea to take revenge for the railway house failed. They never finished the excavation. A handful of brave men stood up in a long struggle with a superior opponent because they realized themselves to be part of something bigger than home. Otherwise, they would not have been able to stand. They knew that there was no land for them beyond the Volga. The defense of the house ended on 24 November and lasted 58 days. On this day, Pavlov's house was preparing for the storming of the dairy house. This house was so cold because of the color of its facade. This is how Lieutenant Afanasyev recalls this assault in his book The House of Soldiers' Glory. On 24 November, we received an order to attack and capture the dairy house, gain a foothold in it and hold on at all costs. For the first time in 58 days, we had to leave a building that had withstood such a siege. And we all thought about it without regret. There was so much temptation and joy in this long-awaited forward. In the evening, forces for an attack began to accumulate in our house. Up to a hundred fighters gathered here. Battalion Commander Zhukov, Deputy Battalion Commander Dorohov, Company Commander Naumov, and the political officer of the machine gun company came. Our garrison was disbanded. All the fighters were divided into two groups. One was to advance on the south side of the square, the other on the north. Comrades in arms were saying goodbye to each other. Who knows what lies ahead? At two o'clock in the morning, the fighters moved to the square through the windows and through the tunnel to the outer basement. Silence. We crawl from funnel to funnel, bumping into barbed wire, twisted iron leaves and rods. Here, someone's metal shovel cluttered against something and the silence of the night cracked with the machine gun bursts. The darkness was illuminated by flashes of explosions and rockets. The Nazis discovered us, mines are exploding all around, explosive bullets are bursting with a bang. Finally, many of us reached the ruins of the former courthouse. Taking advantage of the shelter, we take a break. From the window of the dairy house, an enemy machine gun continuously beat. We were forced to lie low. I ordered the machine gunners to install a Maxim machine gun and knock out the enemy machine gunner. But the machine gunners didn't have time to install the machine gun as three shots rang out behind me, one after another. During the two months of defense of the house, Ramazanov and Tugunov trained to suppress enemy firing points from anti-tank guns. And now, after three shots, the Hitler had stopped scribbling from a machine gun. It was impossible to stay in the ruins for a long time. The enemy transferred artillery and mortar fire here. The dead appeared among us. We crawled forward again, hiding behind rocks, in craters and potholes. There are 30 or 40 meters to the dairy house. The commanders check the fighters. The signal. With a shout of URA, we rush into the attack, literally tearing the threads of tracer bullets with our chests. Grenades are flying into the windows of the house. Figures of fleeing fascists can be seen against the background of ruins illuminated by rockets. The house is taken, but it's only a bare skeleton of the building. There is literally nothing to cling to, and it's necessary to keep him. We count our losses. The company commander Naumov was killed, many wounded, including Pavlov and Shapovalov. And how many comrades were left lying on the square? Our orderlies picked them up there. For our part, we also tried to evacuate the wounded from the dairy house, but it was almost impossible. Enemy fire now penetrates every meter of the square. Our weapons are a machine gun, several anti-tank rifles and submachine guns. 
The first rays of the sun illuminated the dirty, pitted snow. The Nazis decided to return the house. They are going to attack. The main danger is the neighboring building. It's about 20 meters away, and dozens of grenades are flying into our concrete box from there. They fall into the room where we are, and after each explosion, the number of wounded and killed among us increases. Those who can still hold weapons bleeding continue to fight back, and only when their strength leaves them, they transfer the rest of their cartridges to their comrades. The enemy attack has choked, the fascists are retreating, but not for long. We take advantage of a short respite and break holes in the walls, window and door openings, but these are not reliable fences. The Nazis crush them with machine guns and grenades. In the left part of the house, where the second group of our comrades broke in, the situation is even worse. There are only a few people left. Their attempt to connect with us fails. Only two or three fighters were lucky. They somehow managed to crawl over the heavily shot area and join us. As the highest ranking survivor, I took over the team. After the fourth attack of the fascists, we had almost no bullets left. We collect ammunition from wounded and dead friends and distribute it equally among ourselves. Not far from our house on the square, there is a dead fighter. A disc with a handheld machine gun with cartridges is lying next to him. He draws our eyes to him. Private Baldurov, who often came to our garrison with orders from the company, stares intently at the tempting disc. Comrade Lieutenant, may I try? Wherever you go, you won't take a step. They'll shoot you down, one of the soldiers cautiously remarked. What are you going to do without bullets? Wait for mercy from the fascist? Baldurov answered and looked at me questioningly. I was silent, and the soldier apparently guessed that I didn't mind. Baldurov handed his machine gun to his friend and went to the window, opening with a knife. Jumping to the ground, he quickly crawled to the dead fighter. Fountains of earth and snow rose up around him, explosive bullets crackled. In an instant, he separated the pouch from the belt of the diseased soldier with a knife took the disc, and at that time a fascist machine gun struck from the right. We see how Baldurov froze next to the cops. He won back, Voronov says bitterly. And it was necessary to take a risk? They would have stood to the last and then die, so altogether. A minute of silence passed. The enemy machine gun fell silent and the submachine gunners stopped scribbling. And suddenly, Baldurov rolls to his full high and with wide jumps like a trained sportsman rushed back. Shots crackled from all sides, but the fascists were too late, he was already among us. The overcoat and tunic are riddled with bullets, and there is no single scratch on the body. Well, just know, you will survive the war and you will live a long time. Examining the pierced helmet on Baldurov's head, Ivashenko said. Now, the enemy's attention is distracted by what is happening in the square. Reinforcements sent by our command are making their way to our aid there. We understand with bitterness that our people cannot break through such a fire. So, there is only one hope on their own strength, on their own endurance. The battalion commander made another attempt to ease our situation. Smoke bombs were thrown into the square. But on this day, the wind was also against us. It took the smoke completely to the wrong place. We found ourselves in a ring of fire and decided to defend ourselves to the end. There are wounded and dead lying around, weapons covered with bricks and dust lying everywhere, and the enemy continues to attack. The day was nearing its end. The last rays of the setting sun still faintly illuminated the skeletons of the protruding ruins. There are nine of us left in the dairy house. Voronov has finally found a convenient position for a machine gun, and it's now shooting the enemy almost at point blank range. Junior Lieutenant Chernyshenko lies behind a pile of broken bricks next to Greedin. He's seriously wounded, but he still has the strength to hold a weapon. In the next house, the fuss of the fascist is intensifying. One of them, picking up Russian words, shouts loudly in our direction. Hey, Rus soldaten, drop the rifle and surrender. Our soldaten nicht shoot. 
We give you five minutes to think. Nicht give up, you're kaputt. Look at how brazen this Fritz is. He's standing right above the window and yelling, Greedin protested. And you, Greedin, shut his throat, but don't miss, suggested Voronov. Wait, Greedin. Anikin replied and raised his hand to his mouth, made a mouthpiece, and shouted, If you want to live, then surrender yourself, otherwise you will burn in the cauldron. The Hitlerite again wanted to say something, but in the middle of a word he stuttered. Greedin didn't miss. Now hold on, it's about to start. Laying bricks in front of him, Private Hunt, who had been silent before, responded. Well, let it begin. We will hold on as long as we have enough strength. What is your name? Anikin asked. Idel Yakovlevich, and what? It's that simple. We are lying here next to death, looking into the eyes, and we don't know each other. And I'm Alexei Ivanovich, I am from Ivanova. The conversation ended there, the Nazis rose to attack. Fountains of fire and smoke rose up among us. Shrapnel sang in all sorts of ways, bullets whistled. In the thick smoke we can see the attackers, and we hit at random, blindly. Occasionally we throw grenades, there are very few of them left. Before Chernyshenko, a hefty figure of fascists grow up. Bastards, you can take it cheap, Alexei says out loud and lets out a cue at him. The German soldiers falls, but new figures of the occupiers appear out of the smoke. There are many of them, we see enemy grenades exploding around Chernyshenko. His face is swimming with blood. For some reason he tries to get up, and at this time the threat of the automatic burst breaks off at his piles. He falls dead. Svirin and Ramazanov were wounded. At the southern wall Ivashenko, Hunt and Bolderev are steadfastly fighting back. They throw the last grenades at the fascists, occasionally beat them with the single machine guns. Anikin and I are also holding back the pressure of the invaders with difficulty. Voronov changed his position again. He manages to roll the machine gun into the next room and from there suddenly bring down fire on the attacking Nazis. Surprise causes confusion among them, but not for long. They immediately intensify their onslaught. The battle continues, but the forces are not equal, and we have nothing left to shoot back with. There are only 25 or 30 rounds left in the machine gun belt, no more. Voronov is already wounded, but continues to press the trigger of the machine gun. Grenades are exploding around him one after another. I hear him give a short cry. I turn around and see that the machine gunner's left arm is broken, it hangs like a whip. He tears the ring of the last grenade with his teeth and with great effort throws it out of the window into the thick of the fascists. The invaders are confused for a moment, when they come to their senses and they attack the machine gunner again. Ilya Voronov, gathering his last strength, again releases a short burst of machine gun fire at the Nazis, and at this time there are more grenade explosions next to him, he loses consciousness and falls to the ground. His place at the machine gun is occupied by Ivashenko. The last single shot thunders and the Maximka is silent. The last tape has dried up. Ivashenko is also seriously wounded. I run out of bullets and grenades. Junior Lieutenant Anikin, Sergeant Hunt and I crawl into the landing room, sit in a corner and cover ourselves with the bricks so that not every bullet and shrapnel can hit. We don't know if there is anyone else alive in our house. Grenades are bursting everywhere here, explosive bullets are cracking. Well, shall we say goodbye, friends? Scared? I asked the sergeant. No, comrade lieutenant, when you did everything you could, it's not scary to die. But ours must help out. And at this moment we are thrown by a strong explosion. I don't know how long I had to lie motionless. But consciousness is gradually returning. My head is buzzing. It seems that it's covered with a huge bell and a thousands of hammers are beating on it from the outside. There is a mist in my eyes in which magic rings of various colors and shades float. Remembering my friends, I fumble around in the dark. Hunt is lying dead nearby. In the corner I find Anikin wounded and shell-shocked. I start groping for my weapon in the brick fragments. 
and suddenly shots, a Russian URA, and the fighter sent by the command to help us burst into the house. After crossing the square, Anikin and I crawled to our house on the square. Exhausted, we went down into the underground passage. Everything around was familiar, and only the fighters here were different now. Among them, there were none with whom we had to withstand countless enemy attacks. He was very interested in the question of who is defending that house. The Pierce Armor, Gunner Amazonov recalls. We repulsed the attacks of the fascists and then at night collected ammunition from the dead. I remember when Ivan Filipovich saying, Comrades, let's keep one cartridge in each breast pocket in order not to surrender alive and kill ourselves. However, someone objected and said that this should not be done. If there will be no bullets left to strangle the fascists with our hands, machine gunner Alexei Ivashenko recalls. I remember we had a common favorite, comrade Glushenko. He went to the Volga three times on the same day to get water for children and machine gun. The first time he tried to carry a canister of water, the Germans punched it. He went a second time, punched a second time. He went a third time, but still brought water for the children and for the machine gun. As a result of this attack, Sergeant Pavlov was seriously wounded, as well as Lieutenant Afanasyev. Pavlov didn't return to the front after the hospital, and Lieutenant Afanasyev returned. On 29 December, he was discharged from the hospital. For Afanasyev, the war ended in the Czechoslovakia near Prague. How was the legend of Pavlov's house born, and why did they call him that? In the first weeks after the capture of the house, we had to crawl to the Volga River every day under enemy fire to bring water. Not only people need it, it was extremely necessary for machine guns, which were cooled by water. Once, Sergeant Pavlov was sent to one of these raids. On the shore, they accidentally met a correspondent who had just moved from the left bank to collect information from the political workers of the division. He was very interested in the question of who is defending that house. And Yakov Pavlov told him, Sergeant Pavlov. The first publication was published on 31 October 1942 in the newspaper Stalin's Banner. The article of the junior political instructor Chapurin was called Pavlov's House. It took up an entire spread and was an excellent example of army propaganda. The battle for the house was colorfully described in it. The role of senior and junior command personnel was noted. The internationality of the garrison was highlighted. The names of the fighters were even listed. However, the author immediately highlighted the landlord, junior Sergeant Pavel, and the commander of the garrison, Ivan Afanasyev, was left out. The reason for the origin of lies most likely lies in the field of ideology. Firstly, the reconnaissance group that entered the house was commanded by Pavlov after all. Secondly, it was more convenient to raise the spirit of Soviet soldiers by the example of a sergeant, so that the other junior commander would take an initiative and be able to take responsibility in battle, so that they would not feel out of place when, for example, an officer die and a lieutenant is supposed to command anyway. The soldiers and commanders jokingly said, our Pavlov has his own house in Stalingrad. Only the Germans are not registered in it. 8 May 1945 Victory over Nazi Germany Two months later, in July 1945, Yakov Pavlov, the only one of all the defenders of the house, was awarded the hero of the Soviet Union star, and with it, the lieutenant shoulder straps. Much later, 15 years later, they remembered the surviving colleagues of the Pavlov House garrison, who were also awarded medals for the defense of Stalingrad. Ivan Filipovich Afanasyev himself was a man of exceptional modesty and decency. He served in the Soviet army until 1951 and was dismissed for health reasons. Due to the wounds he received during the war, he was almost completely blind. He had several frontline awards, including a medal for the defense of Stalingrad. Since 1958, he lived in Stalingrad. In his book The House of Soldiers' Glory, which he published three times, he described in detail all the days of his garrison's stay in the house. However, for the censorship reasons, the book was still corrected. 
In particular, under the pressure of censorship, Afanasyev was forced to confirm the words of Sergeant Pavlov that there were Germans in the house occupied by them. Also, fragments were cut from Afanasyev's text telling about two cowards thinking of deserting. But in general, this book a true story about those two difficult autumn months of 1942, when our soldiers heroically held the house. Yakov Pavlov fought and was wounded among them. No one ever belittled his merits in defending the house, but the government very selectively caressed the defenders of this Stalingrad house. It was not only the home of Sergeant Pavlov's guards, it was the home of many Soviet fighters. It has truly become the home of soldiers' glory. Ivan Filipovich was the initiator and organizer of all the meetings of the defenders of the House of Soldiers' Glory. Only once they all gathered together. Later, Yakov Pavlov didn't come to such meetings anymore and didn't respond to letters. There is also a mystical story that explains why Pavlov's house remained untouched by the Germans for so long. In addition to the fighters in the basement, there were also civilians in the house who didn't have time to evacuate. Recalls Amma Pierser, Kamal John Tugunov. The war. When we broke into this house, there were civilians, women in the basement. One of them had a baby in her arms, a girl named Zina. We fought the Germans and didn't let the children die, gave them the last food. Among the residents, there was a woman with a newborn baby. Here are her memories from a documentary about Stalingrad. My mother, pregnant, came running with me to this house because her parents lived in this house. They worked as janitors and they had a service room. The city was already bombed at that time. She was lucky that there was a Dr. Komele from Kiev in that house. That's how I was born. We couldn't get out of there anymore. They said that when I was already dying of exhaustion, they wrapped me in food cloth and began to dig a grave. Suddenly, the shovel came across the metal object. It was taken out, and it turned out that it was the icon of the sign. I slowly began to come to life, and here I still have it. Dear friends, that's all for today. Write in the comments what do you think was the strength of the Pavlov house? Mysticism, heroism of defenders, or a well defense? And don't forget to press like if you like the video, and uh, anyway, just write any comments and it's really helped to promote the video. Thank you so much. See you.